Imagine you were standing in knee-deep water on the shore of a small island, watching your ship and only salvation slowly disappearing over the horizon. And no matter how loud you screamed and how desperately you cried out, there was no chance of it coming back. Now imagine this island was remote, completely uninhabited, and in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. Would you be able to survive? And if you were able to survive, how long do you think it would take before you completely lost your sanity? This is the story of Alexander Selkirk and Massachusetts Island. Alexander Selkirk had always been a bit of a loose cannon. Born in 1676 in Fife, Scotland, he was the son of a tanner, and as a kid he was known for his mischief and restlessness, and often got into trouble. His first run-in with the authorities was at 17 when he was charged with indecent conduct in a church. And a few years later, Alexander accidentally drank salt water. His younger brother found this funny and laughed at him, but rather than a normal reaction to some light teasing, Alexander attacked his brother and almost shot him before getting wrestled to the ground by some bystanders. This landed him back in court, or at least it would have if he had any intention of showing up. Some people think Alexander behaved the way he did because his mother was too easy on him. Alexander was her seventh son, and there was an old Scottish superstition that a seventh son was lucky. The seventh son was supposedly a man who could have special powers like being able to see into the future, so no matter how strict his father's discipline was, his mom would always let him off in the belief that he was somehow gifted. And in fact, she wasn't entirely wrong. Alexander was one of the most intelligent kids in his school. He had a knack for problem solving and a talent specifically for the mathematics of navigation. Because of this, his mother often told him he'd be a great sailor. His father, on the other hand, didn't like the idea of his son leaving for a life in the ocean. His other sons had joined him in the tanning business, and he wanted the same for Alexander. To keep him from leaving, Alexander's father threatened to take him out of the will if he left. And this wasn't an idle threat. A tanner made a lot of money back then, and there was a large estate that was supposed to be shared between Alexander and his brothers. So, for a time, Alexander did as he was told and stayed home, but secretly, he always wanted to see the world, and he was just waiting for an excuse to leave. When his behavior finally landed him in trouble with the church authorities again, he decided that this might be the perfect time to set off and pursue his true calling, regardless if he got his inheritance or not. And thankfully, the same restless energy and thirst for adventure that got him into trouble followed him into his new career. Alexander being Alexander, instead of joining the navy or becoming a merchant, he joined up with pirates and buccaneers based in the South Seas. For a time, he was essentially a real-life pirate of the Caribbean, and during which he built a reputation as an excellent navigator. After doing that for a couple of years, he joined the crew of Captain William Dampier in 1703 as a privateer. Being a pirate had been exciting, but it was also dangerous, so Alexander wanted to pivot to something similar but with a little less risk. Ironically enough, a privateer is basically still a pirate. They were just sponsored by the English crown instead of operating independently. Now, in 1703, England was at war with Spain, so any ships that could damage lines and handle the Spanish navy would get a commission from the British navy. This gave them not only the permission to attack Spanish ships, but also a reward for doing so. Under his command, Captain William had two ships. The lead ship was the St. George, which was captained by William himself. Alexander got the position of sailing master on the other ship in his command, which was known as the Sank Ports. This put Alexander in charge of all of the navigation. Not long into Alexander's time with the crew, the captain of the Sank Ports died from scurvy. This meant that the role of captain then went to the first officer, Lieutenant Thomas Stradling. Unfortunately, while William and the old captain got along incredibly well, William and Thomas were not so friendly with one another. In fact, not long after Thomas had taken over, three quarters of his crew almost mutinied after a disagreement with their new captain. Then, in addition to the old captain's death and the new command, the whole crew just generally had a tough year. In one instance, they fought with a French warship but weren't able to sink it or capture it before it escaped. This meant that it then went on to inform the enemy navies who they were and that they were hostile, completely destroying any surprise they had. So from then on, the whole Spanish navy knew who they were, and that meant they were both the hunter and the hunted. This raised tensions further between the crew and captains and later resulted in several close calls with enemy ships and the deaths of many of the crew. And tensions would only escalate from there, especially between Captain William and Captain Thomas. The following year in 1704, on one of their regular missions, Captain William planned to attack a Spanish gold mining town up the Santa Maria River in Panama. Before they reached their goal, though, they were ambushed by the Spanish due to a series of mistakes by William. Then, while the ambush was happening, William panicked and called for a retreat instead of fighting. In response, Captain Thomas was furious and blamed William for wasting time, resources, and lives. He then went on to tell William that he'd made too many mistakes and wasn't capable of leading both ships anymore. At this point, it was seeming inevitable that Thomas and William would eventually have a full-blown disagreement. 
On May 18th, they spotted a small boat and managed to capture it with almost no resistance. It was a merchant ship loaded with supplies and a little bit of money, and Thomas wanted to keep it after finding out that there was a significant amount on board. William, on the other hand, didn't believe the story and cut the boat loose before it could be searched. Thomas again was livid and a massive argument broke up between the two captains. By then, Thomas had finally had enough and he broke the partnership and the two ships sailed in separate directions. Alexander ultimately decided to stay with Thomas. He had seen the mistakes that William had continued to make, and so although he knew Thomas was inexperienced, he realized Thomas was the better option. After separating and inexperienced as he was, Thomas knew his ship needed repairs. The last few months had been tough on the St. Ports. Even the capture of the merchant ship, though surprisingly easy, had taken a toll on its hull. So in August, they dropped their anchor by the island of Massa Tierra, 460 miles off the coast of Chile, and started to patch up the boat. Although this island is small and mountainous, it's forested just enough to have provided any wood the crew needed. At that time as well, the island was completely uninhabited and was one of the few islands in the region not populated by Polynesians. And this was likely because of how remote it is. If you look at a map, you can hardly even tell it's there. There are also no others in the area for hundreds of miles in every direction. It's just this little speck in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. While they stopped at the island, Alexander wasn't happy with the captain's repairs. The sank ports was in really rough shape and riddled with shipworms eating their way through the hull. All Thomas was doing was basically patchwork, but the ship needed proper protection around the hull or it would leak. He'd said this to William before, and just like William, Thomas didn't want to hear about it. Doing that sort of repair would take too long, and he and his men were eager to get back on the sea trying to make money. Alexander and Thomas kept arguing until Alexander packed his essentials into a boat and told his captain he would rather wait on the island than sail on a dangerous ship. He was then rowed to the shore by some of his colleagues. Then he shook their hands and said goodbye, waiting for Thomas to break and agree to some proper repairs. But Thomas didn't break. He stood on the ship, watching Alexander being rowed to the beach. When his shipmates turned around to row back, Thomas didn't even flinch. Instead, he told them to ignore Alexander no matter what he said. When Alexander finally realized that Thomas wasn't bluffing about leaving him behind, he panicked. He rushed into the water and pleaded to be let back on board, but not only did Thomas stay firm, but he also started to mock Alexander. He told Alexander that what he had done was mutiny and that being left behind was the right thing to do. Thomas had had enough of his crew talking back to him and making things difficult. This time, Captain William wasn't around to save him. Alexander would be left on the island and be an example to the others. So, the sank ports began to sail away, and Alexander was officially marooned. The only fortunate thing about the entire situation was that to make his threat seem real, Alexander had brought a chest containing some supplies. In it was bedding and a few changes of clothes, a rifle with some powder and bullets, a hatchet, a knife, and a small kettle. And thinking he might have to hold out for a while before Thomas broke, he brought his Bible, some tobacco, a few navigational instruments, and his book on navigation to pass the time. Unfortunately, despite having these supplies, it didn't really lessen the impact of being marooned. In fact, at first, he couldn't even believe it. He was sure that Thomas would realize he was right and then turn back to pick him up. He even sat on his chest of belongings, staring out to sea for days, hardly eating or sleeping. Then, once he was hungry enough, he just wandered the shore, catching shellfish and eating fish that had washed up. For a while, he stuck to the beach because he didn't think it would be long before someone sailed by, and he didn't want to miss them. But eventually, the days turned to weeks, and then the weeks turned to months. By October, it was spring in the Southern Hemisphere, but Alexander hadn't noticed the flowers that had begun to bloom around him. These first few months were an incredibly dark time for him. He'd spent his life surrounded by people, either his big family back home or his extended family out on the ocean. But now, he was more isolated than almost anyone in history and finding it difficult to cope. And occasionally, this led to some more sinister thoughts. But then after a while, he started to think differently. Alexander spent much of his early youth in the church and it still mattered to him despite the trouble he sometimes caused. His faith helped him again during this time on the island. He thought to himself that he could have been abandoned anywhere, but instead of somewhere desolate, believed that God had left him on an island with all the resources he might need to survive. Reframing it like that helped him to start to feel better about his situation. For about nine months, he stuck to the beach, getting used to a diet of seafood and seals. During the fall, though, the beach on that side of the island becomes a mating ground for thousands of sea lions. When that happens, they can become aggressive if you get too close, and they take up so much room on the beach, it's hard to avoid them. They're also far too big for any human to tackle on their own. On top of this, it was starting to get colder. Winter was on the way, and Massachusetts can drop to 48 degrees Fahrenheit, or 9 degrees Celsius, and can get quite frosty at that time of the year. It also starts to rain more often, and sometimes it can even snow at higher elevations. Finally, Alexander realized that he needed to build a shelter, so he moved into the forest for the first time. Then he found some pimento trees and used the tools he had to cut them down and turn them to a hut to sleep in. He also found some tall grass at the edge of the hills in the area and cut that down and dried it out until it was like straw. 
Then he used that to thatch a roof for the hut, and after the hut was constructed, he used some more pimento trees to make a bed and covered it with the bedding he brought. This hut worked to keep the cold and rain away, but it didn't stop the rats. Whenever Alexander tried to sleep in his new bed, he was woken up by little bites all around his body. He tried a few different ways to keep the rats out so he could get a good night's sleep, like reinforcing the bottom of a shelter and trying to cover the floor with something they couldn't chew through, but nothing worked. Then he had an idea. The rats weren't native to the island. They had been brought there by ships that anchored off the coast looking for supplies. For as long as humans have sailed, they've had a problem with rats on ships, but they also had a way to keep their numbers down, and this was done by using cats. Incredibly, there were also hundreds of feral cats on the island who'd gotten there the same way. If he could capture and tame some of them, he might be able to keep the rats away from his hut. Soon enough, he managed to find some kittens from a recently pregnant cat, and he started to raise them himself. It didn't take long before they started catching rats and any other vermin that tried to get into his huts. It meant sacrificing some of the meat he caught, but that was easily worth it for a good night's sleep. From then on, he kept himself occupied by teaching his cats tricks and even teaching them how to dance. Before long, he also found out that they bred so quickly that they filled the hut he slept in, which Alexander actually didn't mind because he liked the company. Once he could finally sleep at night, he got into the habit of reciting one of the Psalms from his Bible every morning when he woke up and every night before bed. He found it grounded him, helped keep the depression at bay, and let him practice speaking, which was something he hadn't been doing at all since being left alone. Later, he built a second hut a little away from the big one and used that as a kitchen to prepare any animals he caught. Then he found some wood that was fire resistant and used the pill to spit to cook on. Thankfully for him, starting a fire was easy. He had been taught as a kid how to start a fire by rubbing two pieces of wood together. This also meant that the kettle he brought with him was one of his most important tools. He used that to boil the meat, which then made butchering his food easier. And after the success with the cats, Alexander even managed to tame some wild goats. He kept them just outside his kitchen hut and they were a backup in case he hurt himself and couldn't hunt and he even used them for milk. The goats he ate most often though were the wild goats that he chased down on foot. These were his main source of food, but incredibly, they weren't also all he ate. On the island were vegetables like pimento peppers and a type of parsnip. He also foraged for radishes and watercress and experimented with fruit and vegetables that were native to the island. He even found a thick cabbage palm that he could use like bread. Sometimes as a treat, he'd catch a large crayfish, boil it in the kettle, and then eat it with whatever vegetables he'd forage for that day. After about 18 months, Alexander really began to settle into his new life on the island. He had plenty of food and he found a way to keep his mind occupied and stave off the hopelessness that he felt when he first got stranded. He was even happy on the island most of the time and at some point even noticed the spring flowers as they bloomed. Over time as well, he got to know every inch of the area. He knew the safe spots and the dangerous spots, he knew which rock faces were safe to climb and which weren't. Ironically, exploring the island made him fitter than he'd ever been in his life. When he first got there, he could only catch younger goats. After a couple of years, he was fast and strong enough to go for the bigger ones. As often happens though, familiarity breeds complacency and Alexander's overconfidence nearly killed him. One afternoon, he climbed halfway up a cliff about a mile from his kitchen hut as he was following a big adult goat. He hadn't realized how high he was because the tops of bushes obscured the drop, but then when he reached out to grab the goat, he lost his footing and fell back down the cliff onto his back. The fall left him winded and bruised and more than a little stunned and he knew that a fall like that could have easily killed him. He probably only survived because the goat had landed first underneath him, breaking his fall. At the same time though, Alexander was still severely hurt and he lay there for days afterward, likely with some cracked ribs. Finally, after two or three days, the pain started to subside. He still couldn't move much, but he was able to crawl back to his hut, drink a little bit of water, and eat some of the meat he'd stored from an earlier hunt. Then, after he's well again, Alexander thought about the fact that if he had died, there would have been nothing left of him. Something would have eventually found him and eaten him. He even worried that his cats might eat him if he died there, leaving nothing to bury if someone eventually came across his huts and wondered who'd made them. So, from that day forward, he started to cut his name and the date he was stranded on the trees around the island. It was the closest thing he could get to a tombstone if the worst were to ever happen. After living there for a few years, all of his original clothes and bedding were worn out and had big holes in them. Thankfully, he still has goats though and he had the skills gained from years of working as a tanner. So he started skinning them and sewing their pelts together using strips of leather and a sharp needle he'd found in his navigation kit. When his bedding wore out, he used skins for blankets. He even made a short pair of pants, a jacket, and a hat to keep the sun off his head in the summer. He then took his old bed linen and turned it into new shirts. Over time though, even the tools he brought with him started to wear out, but incredibly though, he often found things on the beach he could use to replace them. On one occasion, he found two large metal hoops left by some ship that had anchored near the shore some point before he got there. He was then able to shape those and turn them into knives. It seemed as though every time he needed something, he was resourceful enough to come up with a solution. Unfortunately though, even though he was happier than you might expect living alone on an island, he was still lonely and missed his home in the company of other people. 
Every day, he'd look out for any sign of distant ships, hoping one might come ashore and rescue him. At the same time, it couldn't just be any ship. Getting caught by the Spanish would mean either death or worse. He might get sent to a prisoner of war camp to be used as slave labor in the brutal mines of Peru or Mexico. If he had a choice, it would have been far better to live out his life on the island instead. Then, a few years after he was stranded, it finally happened. A ship finally dropped anchor in the water near the island and sent a boat to the beach. Because it was far enough away, Alexander couldn't see what flag the ship was flying, so he crept down to find out who it was. And any hope of rescue disappeared when he realized they were Spanish. Then, when Alexander tried to sneak back, he must have made a noise because two musket ball shots barely missed his head. He then took off back toward the safety huts and they chased him, firing random shots toward him whenever they could. As he ran, he found a tall tree and after glancing back and realizing no one could see him, he climbed up to the top of it and held still. For a short while, the Spanish hunted for him around the base of the tree, but by some miracle, they couldn't find him and they didn't see his hut. They did see his small herd of goats though, and realizing it was too good an opportunity to miss, they shot a few to carry back to their boat. Once Alexander was sure they were gone, he climbed down the tree and returned to the safety's hut and realized they were so close to finding his home. Had they gone just a little bit further, he might have had to start building another one elsewhere because they would have almost certainly destroyed it. Because of how close this encounter was, when another ship came to the island some time later, Alexander decided it would be better to hide until they were gone. Four years after Alexander was stranded, so now in 1708, Captain William had a new job. Since he had returned to England, he found it impossible to get command of his own ship anymore. News of his failures got there long before he did, so the best he could do was pilot on a privateer vessel called the Duke. The Duke's captain, Captain Woods Rogers, knew William had years of experience even if his ability to command had been questionable. And eventually, William went on to sail back over the Atlantic with the Duke and its sister ship, the Duchess. Then, in January of 1708, the Duke and Duchess approached none other than the island of Massachusetts. They were low on supplies, and the island looked like a great place to stock up before they moved on, and William remembered that island. He remembered how four years ago, his partner had betrayed him and sailed there to repair his boat. Ironically, after leaving the Sank Ports, which was then captained by Thomas, managed to get to the coast of modern-day Columbia before it took on water and sank, just as Alexander had been worried about. The crew who survived were then picked up by the Spanish and imprisoned in Peru. Afterward, they lived out their lives under the kind of conditions that Alexander would have stayed on his island forever to avoid. In any case, as they approached Massachusetts, William's captain had his pilot stop some way out from the island and drop anchor. He decided to start by figuring out what supplies they needed, and then in the morning they'd head to shore to gather them. Later that night, someone on one of the boats spotted a fire that looked like it was on the shore. In the pitch darkness, they couldn't really see exactly where though. It could have been on the beach, but it also could have been between them and the island. And if it wasn't on the beach, it could have been on a ship also anchored close by, and they didn't want to risk letting a French or Spanish vessel know they were there. So they decided not to respond and just stay as quiet and as dark as they could. When morning came though, it was clear it wasn't on another boat. Someone had lit a fire on shore. At noon that day, they sent a small crew over to find out what was happening. Then as they got closer, they heard cries and saw a man running toward them across the beach. He had a long beard and was dressed like a wild animal. His legs were naked and without shoes, and he was carrying a small white flag. The day before, Alexander had spotted the two ships in the distance. Then, after making sure they couldn't see him, he crept closer while trying to figure out where they were going, and more importantly, where they'd come from. He eventually realized they were coming straight toward the island, and they flew the English flag. Right away, he couldn't contain his excitement, and he cheered and shouted because of how happy he was. He was finally going to be rescued. When they anchored off the coast, Alexander realized they wouldn't be able to see him from where they were, and he had to find a way to signal them. So he gathered as much wood as he could, piled it onto the beach, and then spent the day sitting in the same spot where he started his life on the island. Then he just stared out at the sea, waiting for a small boat to come for him. When no one had come in the daylight, he shaped the wood into a beacon and lit it on fire. Then he stayed awake all night to make sure it kept burning. He even also killed and prepared some goats. He knew that if they did find them, they'd be hungry. With a journey that long across the ocean, they were sure to be down to their final rations. Some proper, well-cooked meat would be an excellent welcome to his island. By morning, they still hadn't come, but he was sure they couldn't ignore the fire for long. He just had to be patient. Then, finally at noon, he spotted the boats heading toward him. When they got close enough to spot him, he rushed to the shore and screamed at them. Then they rode toward him, stepped into the beach, and then Alexander immediately ran toward them and embraced them. Incredibly, in those first few moments, he was actually finding it hard to speak. He hadn't spoken to a human for so long that despite the daily practice of the psalms and conversations with his pets, he found it hard to string complete sentences together. Eventually, he managed to be understood well enough to invite them back to see his hut to feed them as he had planned. Then, once he'd shown them his hut, he gathered up as much of his prepared goat as possible and returned to the Duchess. This is when he saw a familiar face and realized it was William. 
But if William was on board, Alexander didn't want to be. His last memories of William and his poor command made it preferable to actually stay on Massateer if he was in charge. It wasn't until the captain finally explained what had happened when William reached England that Alexander agreed to climb on board. Ironically, the feeling wasn't mutual. William told his captain that Alexander was the finest crew member on board the Saint Ports. Afterward, the two ships stayed anchored off the coast for 10 days, refitting and repairing their hulls while adding more supplies. Alexander spent this time hunting for them, ensuring they ate better and helping them to avoid the rations they had left on the ship. He knew he'd have to eat the rations at some point on the journey home, but he wanted to put that day off for as long as possible. He was given some fresh clothes and a pair of shoes to wear, and funny enough, after years in bare feet, they just made him clumsy at first. Then when they left, the captain was impressed by how relaxed Alexander was. The years on the island had given him incredible patience. He never swore or lost his temper, and if problems arose, he tackled them commonly and head on. The captain was also extremely impressed with his navigation skills. Not only did Alexander remember what he knew before, but because the only thing he had to read besides the Bible were navigation mails, he was more skilled than ever. The captain then decided to make Alexander his second mate, which technically meant he outranked William. Following his whole ordeal, Alexander went straight back into the world of privateering as if he never left and spent the next four years at sea causing the Spanish as much trouble as possible until finally reaching England on October 1st, 1711, eight years after Thomas originally abandoned him. During this fruitful time on the Duke, he amassed a wealth of $800 or roughly several hundred thousand US dollars today. William, on the other hand, wasn't so lucky. The owner of the St. George and the St. Port sued him for the damage to the ships. Compared to Thomas though, William got off lightly. William was in debt and branded a failure, but at least he was alive and not mining coal in the worst conditions imaginable. Even so, he died a broken man in 1715. Later on, Alexander was never entirely comfortable with his life back in England. Despite trying to settle down and marry, in 1717 he was back out on the sea, this time as a member of the Royal Navy. He even became an officer as part of an anti-piracy control, with his expertise on the other side of piracy being invaluable. Then, tragically, while on patrol off the coast of Africa, he contracted yellow fever and died on December 13, 1721. In his years after leaving Massachusetts, and despite how hopeless those first months had been, he looked back fondly on his time on the island. This was so much so that apparently he even once said, I am now worth 800 pounds, but shall never be as happy as when I was not worth a farthing. Hello everyone and welcome to Scare Interesting. I hope you enjoyed today's video. If you're new here and you want to see more content just like this, make sure to subscribe and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of the weekly videos. Thank you all so much for watching and hopefully I will see you in the next one.